there, you got to start Facebook. You got to start your camera. Gosh dang it. There's all kinds of things going on today. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost, a day when we have the privilege of celebrating God's gift of adoption through baptism. Our readings today focus on unity, which is kind of timely since there is a lot of divisiveness right now in the world. The good news and the bad news the bad news is that there will always be division, uh, division especially between those of faith and those who don't want to believe and don't want to trust in God. There's going to be that disunity. The good news is that through faith in Christ, we are given true unity. Our worship folder, our worship service is printed out for you. We'll follow that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. Let us confess our sins together. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, I have sinned against you through my own fault in thought, word, and deed. For the sake of the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, forgive me all my sin, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. <clears throat> God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our redeemer and savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. We pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We sing our opening hymn. first lesson is recorded in the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, the 56th chapter. This is what the Lord says. Protect justice and carry out righteousness, because my salvation is coming very soon. My righteousness is ready to be revealed. Then the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, and to become his servants, every one of them who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, those who take hold of my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain, and I will make them glad in my house of prayer. Their whole burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples of the world. This is the declaration of God the Lord, who gathers Israel's dispersed people. I will gather still more people to my house besides the ones already gathered. This is the Lord's word. Our epistle lesson from Ephesians chapter 2, 
verses 13 to 22, this serves as today's sermon text. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He made the two groups one by destroying the wall of hostility that divided them when he abolished the law of the commandments and regulations in his flesh. He did this to create in himself one new person out of the two, in this way making peace. And he did this to reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by putting the hostility to death on it. He also came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. You have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you too are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of God. Fill with the radiance of your grace, the souls now lost in error's maze, and all who in their secret minds some dark delusion on and We hear Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 21. Jesus left that place and withdrew into the region of Tyre and Sidon. There was a Canaanite woman from that territory who came and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. A demon is severely tormenting my daughter. But he did not answer her a word. His disciples came and pleaded, Send her away, because she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt in front of him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered her, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to their little dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. Yet their little dogs also eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, your faith is great. It will be done for you, just as you desire. And her daughter was healed at that very hour. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Gently call those gone astray that they may find the saving way. Let every conscience pour rest in the fine peace and heavenly rest. Shine on the
Grace and mercy and peace be yours from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Christian friends, there is a great deal of hostility on display in our country right now. Whatever happened to e pluribus unum, out of many, one? After all the years of intentional desegregation, there are some minorities on college campuses demanding that their dormitories be resegregated. Meanwhile, gun sales are through the roof this year as people are getting fearful of riots coming close to them and to their towns and homes. During my college years, I lived right next to the Kenosha County line in Wisconsin. My dad worked in the middle of Kenosha at American Motors. I know where those riots are taking place. Last week, Shoreland Lutheran High School on the west side of Kenosha was closed for the safety of the students. Is there anything that can tear down the dividing wall of hostility? Hostility between people is certainly nothing new. In fact, the very first man who was ever born in the world murdered the very second man who was ever born in the world. Paul talks about hostility in our epistle lesson very directly today, especially hostility between Jews and Gentiles. Jews, at the time, looked down on Gentiles, and the Gentiles very much resented them for it. And that particular hostility started when God himself intentionally separated the Israelites from other people. God himself figuratively built a wall around Israel and told them, I don't want you to intermarry with the Canaanites. In fact, I want you to kick the Canaanites out of the land. So why would God do that? What God had in mind was what should be foremost in our minds, namely the promise. The promise of salvation, the promise of the Messiah coming to redeem the world from sins. It was and it is the most important thing in our lives and in all history. God did not want the Israelites to lose faith. In fact, God appointed them. He took one nation and said, I'm giving you a special job. I'm signing a contract with you. Your job, your one and only job is to preserve the promise of the Savior so that I can save all the nations of the earth. And I don't allow you to squander away your faith and lose that promise. The world is depending on it. And it just so happened that the descendant of one of those Canaanite families met Jesus in today's gospel lesson. He was hanging out by the border to Lebanon it's unclear from scripture whether he had crossed the border out of Israel or not, but this woman had heard of Jesus. This woman was looking forward to the Messiah as a Gentile, and she believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And when all was said and done, Jesus commended that Gentile woman, one of only two people in scripture that he commended for having great faith. He commended her for having greater faith than any of the Jews who had been chosen to hold on to and pass on the promise. 
What was it she had faith in? Faith, true faith is never generic. She had faith in Jesus. She trusted that he was the Messiah and Savior through sin. Through faith, Jesus reconciled the Syrophoenician woman not only to God, but now also to his Jewish disciples. And he reconciled them to her. Jesus taught his disciples that day to look at this foreign woman in love as their sister in faith. The dividing wall of hostility was gone. As long as people remain cut off from God, there will always be suspicion and hostility. And as long as people actively reject God and even teach against God, God and argue against him, Jesus' statement will remain true, namely, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. The incredible level of hatred and unrest in our country right now really should not surprise us. It is the direct result of the growing number of people who reject God. It may be a bumper sticker, but it's true. No God, no peace. Atheism's bloody hands have left outrageous stains all over the world. Many are comparing today's anarchy in America to the events of the French Revolution in the 1700s. Back then, they commandeered Notre Dame Cathedral right in downtown Paris, banned church services, and renamed it the Temple of Reason. They slaughtered all those they considered their enemies, including the clergy. And then they began turning their wrath on each other. In the 20th century, atheistic Marxism has exterminated between 60 and 100 million people. Just think of what Stalin did in Mao Zedong and Pol Pot. People are saying that this election year is important. Well, That's a tiny thing compared to this election, this choice, the choice people make about God. Are you for God or are you against God? If people chose to follow God, it wouldn't matter what their political affiliation was. But people cannot make that choice on their own. God says, you did not choose me, I chose you. And how does God choose people and lead them to follow him? He does it through the living and active and powerful word of God, through which the Holy Spirit works in people's hearts to create faith. Which is why we as Christians cannot be silent about the gospel. We can shut up about politics, (laughs) but we should tell people what they need to hear about eternity, about eternal salvation. We need to be clear voices for the truth of God, the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, just as he claims. Jesus has destroyed the wall of hostility with God. He did it by being the only one ever to live in perfect harmony with God. He perfectly kept God's whole law. No one else has ever done that. He's the only one who ever perfectly loved not only his neighbor, 
but also his enemies. He's the only one out of whose mouth never came an idle or a hateful word. Jesus always loved people above his own interests to the point where Jesus even gave his life not only for his friends, but also for his enemies. He gave his life as a ransom for the sins of the whole world, including sins of oppression, sins of hatred, sins of rioting, sins of slavery, sins of self-righteousness, sins of smugness. And when he did so, the temple curtain was rent in two, symbolizing so perfectly how Jesus reconciled the world to God. He tore down the dividing wall of hostility between God and man. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He made the two groups one by destroying the wall of hostility that divided them when he abolished the law of commandments and regulations in his flesh. He did this to create in himself one new person out of the two in this way making peace. By reconciling us to the Father, he has enabled us to be at peace with other people, to be at peace with those who follow God in faith. People are by nature selfish. People want to manipulate and to control others. People want to use other people to their own advantage. But Christians have been empowered and enabled by the Holy Spirit to love our neighbor as ourself. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus taught us. Christians strive for unity in the gospel. Surely that does not work as well as it should because we also are still sinners. We still have a selfish, sinful, old flesh that fights against the new man in us God created. But real Christians do strive to live at peace with all men. That doesn't mean that we're silent. Even Christians have to, at times, argue respectfully with lies and with falsehood. Sometimes Christians have to defend themselves and their families from lawbreakers, maybe even with arms. But don't worry about God. God does not need us to defend him. He's capable of defending himself, and he is also capable of defending us. After all, reconciliation means that God considers us his friends, and God does not walk out on his friends. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, maintain peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for by doing this you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let us strive to reflect the peace of God in our hearts with others and be part of the solution as much as is in us, while still speaking up about the real and only solution that everyone needs to hear so that Jesus can share the gospel through our words. Jesus, who also came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So then, 
you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. You have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Wherever churches around the world remain on the solid foundation of the Old and New Testaments, the prophetic and apostolic scriptures, wherever churches stand on the cornerstone, Jesus alone trusting him for salvation, there are Christians all around the world. And those Christians come in every possible skin tone, speak every language on earth, are citizens of virtually every country on earth. And yet all of those people, as diverse as they are, are brothers and sisters through faith in Christ. They are all members of the one holy Christian and apostolic church that we confess in the Nicene Creed. Jesus has taken away division and created unity. Jews and Gentiles, as Paul says, and that means every version of Gentile, black and white, Hispanic and Asian, Islander and Indian, we have peace with each other because we are at peace with God. He made the two groups one by destroying the wall of hostility that divided them. It only works that way, though, if the foundation of the apostles and prophets remain in, remains intact. The world lies constantly. The world is filled with fake news. Teachers in Tennessee last week were called out for trying to prohibit parents from looking over the shoulders of their children at the computers they were taking off campus classes on because those teachers did not want the parents to hear and object to the propaganda they were teaching the children. The world is filled with lies and falsehood. Worst of all is when the world tells the ultimate and most deadly lie, namely that Christianity is outdated. Christianity, that's what's hateful. Christianity is wrong. Christianity is bad for the country. And especially those claims Jesus made to be the only way to heaven. Oh, how outrageously bigoted. Christianity should be abolished. In other words, they are calling the Son of God a liar. And as long as they do, that division will not go away. The old evil foe is gaining ground in America. And hate is his favorite byproduct. As long as people bow down to the devil and trust his lies, there will be division. The devil loves it when people's blood boils in anger. He is the sworn enemy of peace and harmony and unity. But you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. He is the Savior and he is the truth teller. He is the way, and he is the goal. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. He inspired the apostles and prophets to give us the inerrant word. Without him, there is no unity, no truth, and no salvation. He is the one and only who can destroy the wall of hostility. In the face of division and hopelessness of the world, what a relief it is to know there is and remains one holy Christian church, and there will be 
one holy, unified people in heaven, united in Christ. Today, as on other Sundays, we have a taste of that wonderful unity, however small that taste may be. One day we will experience it fully and always. Imagine the joy of total unity as millions upon millions of people gather together before the throne of the Lamb, united in his praise in perfect harmony and love. Until that day, let us tirelessly work for true unity. Unity in Jesus, unity in his word. The only unity that is real and the only unity that lasts and overcomes. Let us work toward that goal by boldly speaking the truth in love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters in India after the untimely COVID death of the president of the Rajamundri district of our Lutheran mission of salvation in India. Keep them in your tender care and raise up a successor who remains as faithful as Pastor Ananda was. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest upon planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially Joyce as they adjust her medication and Dale Law as he continues rehab at Landmark Hospital. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you who now are at rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, who died and rose again. Amen. O Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy upon us. O Lord Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy upon us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. O Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy upon us. Arise, O Christ, and help us, and deliver us for your name's sake. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A couple of announcements before we continue following the benediction. Uh, shortly thereafter, we will continue with the baptism. And following that, we have uh, a reception down at the other end of the building. After the luncheon, the church council meets today. And I keep forgetting, and I don't want to forget, because today is the first day for the new meditations. If you have not taken your meditations, please take your meditations home with you today. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Just leave mine going. Okay, but maybe turn it a little toward the front. Okay. 